Daryl Ray is with the Recovering from Religion and the Secular Therapist Project. Uh, Dr. Daryl Ray is a psychologist and a lifelong student of religion. He was raised in a uh, fundamentalist home by parents who eventually became missionaries. He has seen religion from the inside out. Both of his grandfathers were preachers and elders in the church. Growing up, he attended three to five times a week and was a church camp counselor a Sunday school teacher, and also a tenor soloist in several church choirs. He preached on occasion and was employed as a, ch uh, a church youth minister for 18 months until he was fired for attempting to integrate the Lily White youth and much more. He holds a BA in Sociology and Anthropology from Friends University, an MA from Spirit University for Christian Workers, and a, uh, an ED in Counseling Psychology from the Peabody College at Vanderbilt University. In 2009, he founded the Recovering from Religion Foundation, um, an organization which uh, is now led by Sarah Moorhead with an international team. It helps people deal with the trauma and also, I'm sorry, <laughs> the trauma of re religious indoctrination. He is also the director of the Secular Therapy Project, connecting secular people with secular therapists all around the world. And he is the author of the best-selling book, The God Virus, How Religion Affects Our Lives and Culture. In 2011, he and Amanda Brown published Sex and Secularism, What 10,000 Secularists Say About Their Sex Lives. And his latest book, Sex and God, How Religion Distorts Sexuality. He recently returned from his book tour in Australia and has spoken many times in the UK, Ireland, and Canada. So let's introduce Daryl Ray. Thank you. Am I on? All right, good. So it's great to be back. This is my hometown. I love to come back and kick some butt. I, I grew up uh, just a few miles from here on the west side the wrong side of the tracks, and uh, went to West Side Christian Church. Does anybody know where West Side Christian Church is? All right. <laughs> okay, well, you know where I grew up with. You know what I grew up with then, if you know that. All right, well, we're going to have some fun today, but I just want to say thanks for putting this conference on. This is the third time I think we, I've been here. It's the third time you've done it. So I've been here every time so far, and I love coming back to Wichita and kind of seeing the, how the movement has grown so much just the last uh, three or four years. I am, uh, first thing I want you to say, I'm, I'm so pleased that uh, the Secular Therapist Project has gotten mentioned a couple different times by JT, by Caleb, and uh, referred to by some other people. I think I, it, I am thrilled to be a part of that, this new initiative. And just last week, we got some major recognition from Dr. Marty Klein, who, who gave, uh, gave me, but it's really an award for all of us, as uh, the Sexual Intelligence Award. He gives an award every year, and uh, there was three, one group, uh, one person, and three groups that got the award. So, uh, go online and read Sexual Intelligence. If you're not a subscriber to that newsletter, it's really, it's a really good newsletter on sex and sexuality. And Dr. Klein is, uh, he's a kind of a hero of mine. He's really uh, insightful. He's written some great articles. Had a good article on uh, the American Humanist a couple months ago called. Uh, you're addicted to what? And it's the whole idea of sexual addiction. And he and I agree that there is no such thing. But that's, a, that's another story we won't go into today. I also want to talk, just uh, to mention just a little bit about recovering from religion. If you, we don't have a recovering from religion group here in Wichita, I don't think. So one of my goals would be to have somebody come and talk to me afterwards or, or connect with me in some way. We need to get a recovering from religion group here because there are people in Wichita who are dealing with religious trauma and they have nowhere to go, nowhere to talk about it. Right now, we have over 150 active meetings, recovering from those meetings. We have meetings in Australia. We have a, a country coordinator in Australia, in Canada, in the United Kingdom. It's growing rapidly. Uh, two years ago, we had 25 meetings. Now we have 150 meetings. And we're adding, uh, on average, about one new meeting a week at this point. And I think it's going to double. That's going to, that rate's going to double pretty soon. And, of course, we've talked a bit about the Sector Therapist Project already. So I'll just say, here are the websites to go to if you're interested. Or talk to me later if you're interested in being a uh, facilitator for a meeting of, of recovery from religion here. Also, how many of you have read, 
seen uh, Richard Dawkins' new documentary, uh, Death, Sex, and the Meaning of Life. Oh, only a couple. Oh, it's a great documentary. And Dawkins is starting to hit on something I think we all need to, to be more um, active about. And that's, you know, how does sex and death and all that play into our lives as atheists and communicating that to those out there who are religious. Uh, and not least of which, he interviewed me for that particular one, so I'm very happy about that. But if you're interested in any of that information uh, that, that uh, Elise just said, you might go to our uh, ipcpress.com and, and look at some of the downloads there. We've got downloads on leadership in the secular community, an article that I think hits home for what you need to do if you're a leader, and, uh, and the survey she mentioned about sec sex lives of secularists. We found a whole lot of stuff from 14,000 people told us, uh, atheists mainly, that told us about their sex lives. And finally, I just got back from Australia, and I met the coolest people on the planet there. I didn't realize, but you had to go to Australia to find the coolest people. Uh, this is Fiona Patton. She is the president of the Australian Sex Party. Now, that's like the Republican or Democrat Party. It's a serious party. They run candidates for office there. She was actually a candidate, and they actually get significant numbers of votes. And they cooperate very closely with the, with the uh, Australian Secular Party. I met the president of that one, too. I, I mean, all these people were just in Melbourne, happened to be in Melbourne about the same time that I was. So we had a great supper together. And got to meet these cool people that are, are really cutting edge of secularism and uh, sexual stuff in Australia. But uh, can you imagine a sex party in Kansas? <laughs> <laughs> It's called the Catholic Church right now. <laughs> They're pretty consumed with sex, but not the way we are. All right, well, the name of my talk today is The Shame of It All, or Why Do We Act Like Christians? So I have a question just to begin with. Do you masturbate? I masturbate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a few liars in the group, but I are. It's all you ambidextrous people, too, if you're headphones. <laughs> all right. Imagine asking that question in a, in a church in a Catholic church, a Baptist church, or a mosque, or a Mormon temple, what would happen? I'd be fired. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody. Oh, you would see the hands too. Nobody would raise their hands. And yet we know that all of them are doing it. Most people masturbate, at least in some degree. And if they don't right now, maybe because of health problems or age problems or something, they have done it in the past. And to lie, outright is what we see in, in religionists. Religionists live a lie, and it's a lie based on shame. The shame of human sexuality, the shame of their bodies, the shame of, of sexual activity, the shame of sexual expression. Uh, and they're ashamed of, that, to admit things like they had premarital sex, or that they masturbate, or that they use porn. They're ashamed that, they, to, that they've done sex acts that they are disgusted with. Uh, they're ashamed to tell the truth about sex to their children. So it's, it's a big lie. If you're a religionist, you are living a big lie. They lie to themselves about their own, be their own sexual behavior. And we saw evidence of this in our, in our survey uh, of you know, the 14,000 sectors. We saw evidence that religionists lie about their sexuality to their own children and to themselves. And in the way we, what we did is we asked what religion were you raised in, and you know how did your sex life change when you left that religion? And about 80% of our population that we sampled, or that we talked to, um, had been raised in some kind of religion. So they could tell us what, was, what the sexual behavior was like before, what it was like afterwards. We asked a lot of questions about parents. How did your parents talk to you about sexuality? And what we found was people who was ra were raised by very secular parents were much less shamed around sexuality and masturbation Children or people raised by religious parents, much more shame and, and uh, around those kinds of things. They preach against the very behavior that they themselves engage in, and they lie to their children about the behavior, as I've said earlier. So how do we know this? Because the research shows it. We've got tons of research, and it's not, not, not just talking about our research. We know that, that religious people engage in virtually the same sexual activities as religious people do. The only difference is, they're more guilty about it than we are. They start masturbating about the same time. They start having premarital sex about the same time. They have the same kinds of sex 
at about the same time, whether it be oral sex, uh, vaginal sex, even anal sex, those some sorts of things. If you go to the abstinence-only research that the U.S. government has spent about a billion of your do tax dollars uh, researching and teaching, that research shows that not only does it, does it fail, the abstinence-only fails, it doesn't work at all, but it shows that the children who get abstinence-only start these sexual activities the same as the kids who don't get abstinence-only. We also know that kids who are raised in very religious homes still do the same things about the same time. Because what the key is, biology happens. Biology happens. Your biology is going to program you to start masturbating. It's going to program you to seek out potential sex partners. So the other thing that religionists do is they give false information to their children. They teach that condoms don't work or you shouldn't have sex before marriage and that sort of stuff. So we also have other evidence that religionists, if you look at the uh, um, SDI infection rate in the United States, it's highest in the most religious states, even highest in the most religious counties in the United States. In fact, if you look at where abstinence only is taught, that's where the highest sexually transmitted infections are. Emily, am I, are you out there? All right. Great. Sign my what? Sign my yeah, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> We also see that religionists use pornography just as much as anybody else. They probably use it more. There's a great book came out a couple years ago called A Billion Wicked Thoughts, and it documented the internet use of pornography. And what they clearly showed was people in the most religious states use porn more than non-religious people do six days out of the week. So on Sunday, it goes down, but they more than catch up with it the other six days. Yeah, it took a while for you guys to catch that one, didn't it? <laughs> we also know that religionists tend to get divorced more than secularists. Now, these are not gigantic differences, but they are significantly, statistically significant differences. We also know that religious ministers have an equal divorce rate to the parishioners in their own congregations. So Baptist ministers divorce at about the same rate as Baptists divorce. And Baptists, as a whole, divorce more than atheists, agnostics, or secularists do. And here's the kicker, they have more abortions. Religious people have more abortions than non-religious people. Now, we might just think, because they know how to use birth control. We know how to use birth control. They don't. Or they're telling their kids things that get them infected with you know, with uh, diseases or get infected with, or, or get them pregnant. So there's a lot of evidence out there. But because of their shame, because religion teaches shame, religions can't rationally evaluate their own behavior, so they end up denying that they do something even as they're doing it. How many parents have said, I never masturbated, and you shouldn't either, even as they go home, they go to bed that night, masturbate. Uh, how, they have difficulty controlling and channeling their own sexual urges because they're too busy denying them. If you deny you, you're doing something, you're not meeting that physical need. So it's very likely that need's going to get channeled in inappropriate places. Now, Emily made a reference to uh, the age, age range of when uh, abuse happened among uh, Catholics priests, one was it Emily, who was it that was talking about that? I'm sorry, Lex, you, you made that, okay. Well, I have a hypothesis, I'd love to test it. In my own clinical uh, work years ago, what I noticed was Catholic priests, I had Catholic priests come to me, I noticed that they were very interested in that age range, that like 12 to 15 age boy. And so I could ask, well, when did you decide to be a priest about that age, 12 to 15? Well, at that age, you are biologically programmed to search, start searching for sex partners, for what's appropriate in your culture for sexuality. And most of these priests are sent off to all boys' schools, oftentimes, at that very time. So your brain is being programmed as a priest to look at that age group. And what, what these kids, these priests, will come to me, and after a few weeks of listening to say, I'm, I'm addicted to porn, I'm I'm addicted to masturbating, and I'd, I'd say to him, well, you sound like a perfectly normal 13-year-old boy. 
And that's where I think they were stuck developmentally. Like many priests and many nuns are stuck at that 13 to 15 year old uh, stage, and they're fixated at that, at that stage. Now, it's a hypothesis of mine based upon some of my clinical work. But, we, but your, your uh, numbers that you were giving really fit right in, right within that as well. So priests have trouble channeling their, their sexual energy appropriately, so they end up coming out in appropriate places. We also see if you go to the, if you go to the uh, uh, website stopbaptistpredators.org, Google that sometime, stopbaptistpredators.org, it's a whole website dedicated to pointing out all the Baptist ministers that are raping children and having inappropriate behavior with people in their congregations. Now, and it's only mainly the illegal parts. I mean, it's not illegal for a 40-year-old Baptist minister to have an affair with a 30-year-old woman. That's not illegal. So that's not going to make it into the Stop Baptist Predators unless there was a rape involved or something like that. So we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg of how much inappropriate sexual expression there is among, say, Baptist ministers. And nobody is keeping track of the Seventh-day Adventists or the Mormons, but I'm sure we've got the same thing going on there. So religionists experience a lot of self-loathing and fear of their own natural urges, and it can lead to depression, it can lead to sexual expression that gets them in trouble, it's illegal, it hurts other people. They also lie to their spouse and their children about the kind of sexual activity they are or are not engaged in. And they express frustration and anger and typically blame other people for their, for their sexual deviance there, you know, for their own, what they think is deviant. Now, here's, here's another hypothesis I've got. I think there's quite a bit of evidence for this. I think that a huge amount of homophobia, especially among men in the United States, is directly related to their own fear of their own masturbatory activity. Now, guys, answer me the question. Answer me honestly here. When you were in eighth grade or ninth grade in the gym after afterwards, and you were taking a shower with all the other boys, did you ever hear somebody say, "You shake it more than three times, you're playing with it"? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, didn't you? That is a that is a clear signal something's wrong with touching yourself, and. Think about this. When I was, I went to West High School, went to Mayberry Junior High right here in town. In those, after you go into the gym, you take a shower, you would come out and you would step in this powder that kept foot fungus from spreading. So it would kill the foot fungus and you'd put your gym shoes on or whatever and leave. Now, if they didn't have that in there, it would only take one boy with foot fungus to infect dozens, maybe hundreds of other boys in that school with foot fungus. I'm assuming it's the same for girls, but I didn't get any girls, unfortunately. They didn't let me. <laughs> so, so imagine that. So foot fungus can be spread that easily in a gym. The same thing is happening with respect to the God virus, infecting children, other teenagers, with religious ideas about sexuality. If you shake it more, all you need is one religious boy in that group to tell other boys, if you shake more than three times you're playing with it, you must be a homo. Before we get homophobia started, we get persecution of anybody who's different, anybody who admits to masturbating. And even if a lot of boys are secular inside of that gym, gym locker room, they still could get infected with these crazy ideas about their bodies, about other people's bodies, and about their own sexuality. Here's evidence, and it comes straight from our friend um, Mark Driscoll of the mega church out in Seattle, uh, Mars, Mars Hill mega church. He said, masturbation can be a form of homosexuality because it's a sexual act that does not involve a woman. If a man were to masturbate while engaged in other forms of sexual intimacy with his wife, then he would not be doing so in a homosexual way. However, any man who does so without his wife in the room is bordering on homosexual activity, particularly if he's watching himself in the mirror and being turned on by his own male body. I never thought of that. New technique discovered here. So we can see here, ladies, you notice he's letting you off the 
hook. There's nothing in the Bible about women masturbating. So you guys get off the hook. It's all focused on male masturbatory activity, which I think shows right here. Here's a, one of the major ministers in the United States talking about actually creating horror of one's own body and looking at one's own body, masturbating in any form. So what religion does is it gives us a one-size-fits-all approach to sexuality. Uh, it, it's an unnatural approach. It is designed to make you feel guilty, and it's intended to create shame in you. So now let's look at just one little scientific fact. For every time you have a live birth, a human baby live birth, you probably had sex 10,000 times or more, maybe. And let's include masturbation as a sex act, but it's, because it is. Even if, that's a huge amount. And, and then we have people who are choosing not to have children. That means their entire sex life is nothing to do with birth, with procreation. So just that single fact tells us something. Because the Pope says, have sex like a dog. And think about this. My dog, and that's my dog, Sugar, she's got a rule. I have to put her picture up here and no other dogs first. Uh, sugar, if Sugar had sex, she's a female, she would only have sex when she was fertile and ready to be implanted with, you know, sperm and egg. Insects are the same way. Cows are the same way. Almost every species on this planet only has sex when they're ready to be, uh, have babies or have or lay eggs. Almost every species on the planet with a very few exceptions. Some of those exceptions include like dolphins, uh, chimpanzees, bonobo apes, and humans. So there are a few species that just have sex for the fun of it. And yet the Pope, whether it be this Pope uh, or this Pope, it doesn't matter. We have two Popes now. Uh, they, the Pope says you can only have sex for procreation. So what I'd like to point out to our friends, the Catholics, are that you, your pope, your church says, have sex like animals. Think about that. How many times have you had religions say, well, you atheists just want to have orgies, and you atheists just want to be lascivious and have sex any time? Well, yeah, because that's the way humans are. We're, we, we like sex, and we like lots of sex, just like the Nobo apes, and pretty much like chimp chimps as well. <clears throat> so, shame, fear, and guilt are the, are the bottom line for almost all the major religions. There's almost no religions on this planet that don't try to impact and plant those in it. It's always an advantage because it's, um, it creates fear and irrational shame and guilt in you that you can only get rid of by coming back to the place where you learned it. Religion will give you the disease, in this case, guilt and shame. And then the only place you can get rid of it is by coming back to the place you learned it from. Baptists don't confess their sins to Catholic priests. Catholics don't confess their sins to, to Muslim imams. You only confess your sins. You only get rid of the guilt at the place you learned the guilt. Only the place you got the disease can you get the semi-cure, the, the false cure, the fake cure. So without guilt, fear, and shame, I would suggest that all the religions, all the major religions, would collapse. Imagine Pope waking up one day and saying, whoa, I had a great wet dream last night. I think we'll make masturbation legal in the Catholic Church. That's probably not going to happen. Or Ted Haggard waking up one morning and saying, man, that male prostitute I was with last night really was good. I think we'll make homosexuality legal in the evangelical movement. No, we're probably not going to see that because shame and guilt break you back. And the, the, the religions that are not teaching shame and guilt aren't growing very much. Unitarians aren't growing that much. Ethical societies aren't growing that much. Congregationals aren't growing that much. Name any religion that doesn't push lots of shame and guilt, and I'll show you their numbers are probably declining. They're not growing. Baptists, fundamentalists, evangelicals, anybody pushing lots of shame and guilt, they have a hook to grab people. And where do they grab them? They try to grab them in adolescence when they're most susceptible to guilt and shame messages. So let's talk a little bit about shame and let's also talk about politics. 
because it's been very, very uh, much in the news before and after this election. But I want to show you a man who has never masturbated. He never had sex outside of marriage. He never used birth control. He's a very strong Catholic. Oh, his wife did have an abortion, but it was okay for them because they prayed about it, as I understand it. But he wants to give you the Catholic STI. And yes, I think religion is a sexually transmitted disease, and he's one fucked up dude, by the way. <laughs> or look at this fellow. I mean, he is so happy by the 47%, but it's the 47% here that use that, uh, the, if you do internet porn searches, for gay porn, those are the high spots in the United States for gay porn <laughs> searches. Do you see any similarities to the states that went for Mitt Romney? Wherever you see, wherever you see people who are suppressing their sexuality, it's going to come out somewhere else. Now, you've seen preachers preach and preach and preach against pornography, and yet we see pornography being used more by the religionists than by the non-religious, by the secular. Now, I'm all in favor of porn. It's not a problem for me at all. But, but the internet search data shows us that religionists are preaching against it, yet using it more. Again, it's an example of sexual energy being channeled into, quote, inappropriate places. I mean, it's them that says it's inappropriate, not me. And then they turn around and condemn us, condemn other people for that. Or then you get people like Rush Limbaugh, who shamed, who, who spent a week trying to shame Sandra Fluck, and she was stood up to him, called him for what he was, the biggest asshole on the planet. Well, I don't think she used those words, but I think that's what she meant. But shame, we saw Rush Limbaugh using typical, oh, typical Christian shame, religious shame, although he never he didn't talk about it in those terms. But where did he get this notion that women have their place? Women should not get free birth control. Women should not get uh, a proper health care. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from his own religious tradition, his own religious training from point in time. And finally, male shame. There are, there are, there's, we see in the Muslim world, and we are horrified when a father kills his own daughter because she had sex with a boy, or because she just kissed a boy. It's, it's horrendous to us when we think, how could you be so primitive? Well, that is an example, an extreme example, if you will, but still an example of male shame. We think about female shame, and religions are very good at shaming females, very good at it. But what we don't think is, what's the male side, the flip side, the other side of that same coin? That coin is that males are told, you should control your women. They also taught that from the time they were very young. I remember getting taught that in, in Sunday school and high school when uh, male teachers, male Sunday school teachers, male coaches would say, whisper, basically whisper, your girlfriend's not dressed appropriately. You need to tell her something about that. Like I'm the one responsible for my girlfriend and how she dresses. How many of you guys were taught in some way, shape, or form that you were responsible for the sexuality of the women you're involved with. All right. If you were raised in a religious home, a very religious home, you got that message very clear. My grandfather was very clear <coughs> about the peak. My grandfather, country church preacher, right, right here in Wichita, uh, was very clear that the women in his church should be subject to the men. And if he saw a woman in his church that was dressed wrong, he wouldn't have brought <coughs> a woman. Of course, he shouldn't have anyway, but he would go to the man. He would say, your daughter is sinning because she's dressing it, dressed that way. And I heard my grandfather do this many times. Or if I didn't hear him personally do it, I heard him talk in the dinner table afterwards. I told him at the church today he needs to get control of his daughter or she'll be a prostitute or, you know, something like that. So this idea of male shame, it reflects back on the male if the women don't behave the way they're supposed to be. Male, all men are also told you must control yourself. You must control your own sexuality. You must control your masturbatory behavior. And we're going to shame you in, in places like the locker room. So religion gives you the disease. Then it offers you, offers you the cure for the disease. But it's a disease that denigrates our humanity and tells us to act like animals rather than by the human beings that we really are. 
So I want to give you a quote, and I want you to remember this quote. You can just test it out as you go around. You can take religion out of sex, but you can't take sex out of religion. Remember my example of the Pope, or Ted Haggard. Religion must have sex in order to survive. It's, it's the essence of all patriarchal religions. Sex, sexual control. Sexual control of males and sexual control of females. Now, you're probably saying, but you know, I'm not religious. Why are you telling me all this, Carolyn? I agree with you. Well, I'm going to tell you this. I think we are swimming in a culturally polluted pool. And you have been infected by some of these ideas. Your behavior has been impacted by some of these ideas, and you may not even know it. I have known lifelong atheists that still had hang-ups about sex. And if you ask them, where did you learn that? One of my best friends is a lifelong atheist, and he's got hang-ups about oral sex. And I said, where did you learn that? From, if you ask him that, he says, from my strongly devout Methodist mother, who told me it was disgusting, and God hates it. Well, he learned that when he was 12, 13, 14 from his mother. He still hasn't got over that. So I think there's many secularists that are infected with religious sexuality. So if you experience any guilt or shame around your sexuality, my hypothesis about that is that you're probably infected with religion still. You know, just because you don't have um, measles, was it measles? doesn't mean the virus isn't still in your system, because it can come out later as, as uh, I'm sorry, chickenpox. Just because you don't have chickenpox now doesn't mean you don't have the virus in your system. It can come out as shingles as an adult. And I think that's kind of what's coming out. Yeah, you've been an atheist since you were 30 years old, or you, you got rid of religion when you were in college, but now you're 40 and you're still hung up about something. That's probably evidence of religious infection. The virus is still present in you, Let's find a way to get rid of that, and let's start dealing with it. Here's a way to look at it. I think we act like Christians when we hide or act ashamed of our sexuality. We act like Christians when we pretend like we didn't do something uh, like having premarital sex, or we don't admit out loud to our children, yeah, I, I masturbate. Uh, or we let religionists condemn us for perfectly legitimate, legal, normal sexual behavior. And probably one of the most heinous <clears throat> of all is you're acting like a Christian when you have difficulty talking to your partner about sex, about fantasies, about what you'd like to try or not like to try. Now, I'm not saying your partner has to engage in those or has to do it, but if you can't even talk about it, that's a problem. You might be uh, ashamed acting like a Christian if you're ashamed of pornography. I don't know if you've driven across Kansas on I-70 or Missouri on I-70. These are all over I-70. Now let me clue you in. The, the, vid, the porn shops love these. Because they're a bigger advertisement for what's below than that is. I mean, that costs nothing compared to that. They're paying two or $3,000 a month to keep that up there. And it's big advertisement. You still see, I've never seen any video shops going out of business on I-7. In fact, there's probably more now than worth 20 years ago before they started doing that. So, here's the way. Remember Jeff Foxworthy and he said, had the, uh, uh, you might be a redneck. Yeah. Yeah, well, you might, I, I'm going to change that to a little bit. Instead of you might be a redneck, you might be a Christian atheist if you feel guilty about masturbating. You might be a Christian atheist if you have difficulty talking to your children about sex or sexuality. You might be a Christian atheist if you uh, have difficulty talking to your spouse or partner about fantasies you would like to engage in or like to try. You might be a Christian atheist if you feel disgust around normal sexual activities. And you might be a Christian atheist if you shame other people, especially women, for being sexual. This is probably the thing that pisses me off the most, is when I see here in our own atheist community and it's mostly men shaming women, using sexual terminology in, in, legal, in, in discussions that have nothing to do with sex. They're criticizing or disagreeing with women online and using slut-shaming language with, with 
you know, and reasonable, supposedly reasonable argumentation. And I see that way too much in our own community. Now, I can't reach out there and grab those guys by the throat and slap their face about 20 times. I can't do that. But you can help me, and you can help other people. When you see that happening, I don't care whether you agree or disagree with what's going on. You can, you can slap that person down in public, on the forum, and say, slut shaming is inappropriate in this forum. Slut shaming is wrong. I don't approve of it. I don't care if you're male or female. We need to be taking care of that. And in our own community, we need to police ourselves around that kind of behavior. Now, it does go both ways. I've seen women do it to men, denigrate their masculinity or something. But that doesn't happen nearly as often as, as the other one. So, sex is religion's weak spot. I hope I've established that in your minds a little bit. And I think we shouldn't let the religionists dictate to us what their guilt messages are or make us feel guilty. And I think we should follow the lead of the gay community, uh, kind of what uh, JT said earlier. The gay community has decided some years back, I don't give a shit what you think. I'm coming out. I'm going to be who I am. I'm going to be proud of who I am. I'm going to march in gay pride. I'm not going to dress in a certain way. I'm not going to get married just because you think I should get married to a female or a male if you're, you know, same sex. Uh, so I'm going to be who I am. And look at the difference that is made in what's going on right now. Just coming out as gay has now made one of the top Republicans who will now not be able to run for president. Rob Portman, was it Portman? Uh, of Ohio, was he Ohio? Michigan, Michigan, I think it was. He came out just yesterday and said, uh, his son is gay and he's now in favor of gay marriage or whatever. I'm not sure what he's in favor of, but he certainly changed his tune. And a lot of Republicans are getting really pissed off about it, a lot of conservatives. But I think we can follow the, the lead of the gay community because they've, they've done something that's it's, it's equivalent to the civil rights movement in the 60s. You know, the more you stay out there and push, push your agenda, and I mean in a positive way, the more likely other people are going to realize, yes, you do have a legitimate complaint. We have had the most fun this week in Kansas City. How many of you have been following the, the uh, St. Patrick's Day parade thing? Oh, if you haven't done it, you got to get online and just follow. We have, we have been kicking some ass in Kansas City this week. They won't let us march in the gay pride because they don't want to denigrate the, the memory of St. Patrick. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in St. Patrick's Day Parade, but there's a lot of denigration going on there. <laughs> what they have at that parade is really pretty profane, if not pornographic. But atheists can't march. So we have gotten news releases, we've gotten radio interviews, television, I think six or seven television radio interviews. It's just exploded. And we just I just noticed about two hours ago, the uh, Kansas City Star has put two editorials saying you should let the atheists march in the parade. Now, they have a legal right to discriminate against us. And JT's written about it, he even written, wrote about it for us. <laughs> but just because they got a legal right doesn't mean it's, it's, it is right to do. And we are just beating them up over all this stuff. Not only that, but now we've got another press release out that just was picked up by the Kansas City Star. And they're uh, talking about us having an Ask an Atheist table on the parade route that's going to have a big sign that says, why can't we be in this parade? Now, if they'd have just let us in the parade, <laughs> we wouldn't have had any opportunities. But by standing up and saying, we're atheists, we want to march in this we have really made this idea of discriminating against us a big issue. And I am so proud of the Kansas City Atheist Coalition and, uh, and the board and the members of that group. I helped found it, but I'm, I'm not involved as much because I travel so much. I just so just want to know. They have set to me, uh, for me, they've set a, a standard for what you can do in communities. They're really cool, cool group. So let's be out about our sexuality. Let's respect and support others in their sexual choices. Uh, because it's a direct challenge to religion. I am not a Christian, and I don't have to act like a Christian. <laughs> so here's, here's ways to, to not act like a Christian and challenge them. I mean, I see us challenging all over the place in this God debate stuff and is religion good or bad and all that. But I think there's some other ways to challenge that are even more interesting around sexuality. 
I can talk to a fellow coworker who thinks sex is premarital sex or whatever is wrong, and I can tell my coworker, well, sure, I fornicate, just like many religious people do. Let's not let them get away with denying they do it too. I'm proud of it. I'm not against fornication. Fornicate all you want. Sure, I masturbate. Don't you? Let's let them squirm in the knowledge that, yeah, they do it, and they're lying. And they say, oh, no, I don't do it. You know darn good while they're lying most of the time. Or if they admit it, you have just put a crack in their religious sexual identity. You have forced them to rethink whether it's good or bad to masturbate. I mean, I look like a fairly healthy male. I've got a healthy sex life, and I masturbate, and I don't let anybody tell me I can or can't. That's a healthy way to confront religionists. And it just, it just in your face. Now, I'm not saying it'd be inappropriate. I'm not saying, you know, flash or anything. <laughs> I am saying, let's not deny who we are any more than, than we see gays deny who they are nowadays. Sure, I enjoy pornography, just like most religious people. They just can't admit it. Oh, by the way, did you notice the highest use of porn is all in all the religious states? You don't use porn, though, but I do. Make them lie to you. Make them stand up and actually say, oh, no, I don't do that, because the cognitive dissonance in that is powerful. You've made them lie to you, and they know darn good well they're lying to you. Now they've got it, they will admit it in some way, shape, or form, and it puts a little crack in that sexual identity of theirs. Frame their behavior. Most patriarchal, all patriarchal religions want to control women, women's bodies, and women's sexuality in order to get successful religious infection. I mean, let's face it, women are the primary caregivers in most cultures for children. So you've got to give the shame and guilt messages most powerfully to the women. So they will pass the shame and guilt messages on to their children, especially their daughters. And we need to challenge their behavior. And we can do it in this way, that very behavior. We could say, a woman might say, uh, I take birth control because I like sex, inside or outside of marriage, just like Newt Gingrich and Rush Limbaugh do. <laughs> Let's point out their double standard. How the Rush Limbaugh's in his fourth wife, I think, and Nick Gingrich is on his third wife, or no, third robot. I think the third one is a robot, I'm not sure. And the other thing is, Gingrich, Gingrich's own staff members said there was numerous times when he was a congressman that they had to come knock on the car window while he was screwing some woman in the car. They had, you got a speech in 10 minutes. You know, put your clothes on. And that's his own staff members. This man is, of course, now a devout Catholic. He's converted to Catholicism, just like our, our governor here in Kansas did recently. So look at that statement. That is an in-your-face challenge to the religionists when they say premarital sex is wrong. Well, your own heroes have done a hell of a lot of premarital sex. Be, be tactful, but be aware, uh, and, and be aware of the possible consequences. But if you're, if you're a practicing nudist, for example, be proud of it. There's no, nothing illegal with being a nudist. Uh, if you're kinky, be not ashamed. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm kinky. I like being kinky. Uh, I have no problems with people being kinky, as long as it's with you know, mutual consent. Uh, if you're polyamorous, if possible, let people know. Being poly is a sexual choice, and it's a sexuality of ours. I've been poly for the last 12 or 13 years, and it fits me better than I can ever fit. I'm happier than I've ever been. If you're anything sexual, be as open as you reasonably can. I don't, I don't want you getting fired over it. I don't want you losing unnecessarily family or friends. But just like the gay community said, I'm going to come out to my family, to my friends, to my workplace. I think we can come out too. And we can do the same thing in many ways. So also support other people. Be open, openly vocal, be openly supporting others when religionists condemn them. So if you're in the if you're in the lunchroom and somebody starts talking about that, you know, that heathen or that gay guy or that anybody doing whatever wrong, saying that premarital sex is wrong, then I would stand up and say, well, you know, I see nothing wrong with premarital sex. I've had it, and I tell my children it's okay too. Write letters to the editors. Write on Facebook. You you can 
You can hide behind your, your you, you can hide your sexuality, or you can express it in appropriate ways. And there's lots of ways to do it. Online is, is a very good place, I think. Uh, here's something I think they all masturbate. So don't don't let them get away with pretending that they don't. Don't don't debate whether God exists or not. Debate whether they masturbate or not. Think about that. If you say yes, I masturbate. I teach my kids about it. Uh, it's likely that you're going to challenge their guilt-based system. In casual conversation, you might say, sure, I talk to my children about masturbation and birth control. I told them how normal it is and not to listen to other children if they say their religion says it's wrong. And you can just imagine an over-the-fence conversation with your next-door neighbor. And you just casually let that out. Well, shit, you've just opened a big can of worms for these people. Because they don't, they can't conceive of being that positive and that open. In conversation, you might say, yes, my husband and I have been in an open relationship for 20 years. We enjoy it a lot. It's not a big deal to us. What I've noticed in the, in the, uh, in the fetish community and the poly community is they, they tend to keep it low key and hide it. But they're everywhere. I mean, if, you, if you've ever been to a fetish convention, there are hundreds of people at these conventions, hundreds of couples at these conventions. And they're, they're having a lot of fun. They're all out about it. But the minute they go home, they're quiet about it. They don't want anybody to know about it. And it's, it's a shame, because here we have an opportunity to challenge. Of course, <laughs> I, I've also noticed how many Baptists are at these fetish conventions. <laughs> that, that is mind-boggling. I can't. It's really amazing that Catholics and Baptists show up. Not for Catholics, because they're into self-flagellation, of course. But the Baptists, I don't know. So I'm not a Christian, and I'm not bound to Christian rules on sex or sexuality. I don't have to pretend that I follow their rules either. I can quietly challenge their guilt-based religious ideas and simply being who I am and talking matter-of-factly about my own sexuality. So. If someone was racist in front of me, I would challenge them. If someone was sexist in front of me, I would challenge them. If someone was sex negative in front of me, I also challenge that. And I think that's a piece that we could add to our repertoire in living in our culture is let's start challenging sex negative language. Not only, I mean, I think we should challenge sexist language, of course, but sex negative language can be just as powerful just as denigrating to people, and it's, it's designed to intimidate people into hiding their sexuality. So let's let go of something. Let's let go of shame about your own body. That's the number one thing I'm going to caution you, ask you to think about here. Get rid of body shame about your own body. And let me give you a news flash. This, this came in over the AP wire today. It's the only body you're going to get. There's no afterlife. You're not going to get resurrected with a brand new body of a 20-year-old anymore. And we have to learn to respect our bodies. I was always taught, you know, the Lord, your body is the temple of the Lord, and all that bullshit. I noticed that a lot of these people didn't respect that body, if it was the Lord's temple or not. But I think it's good advice. Respect your body. Don't be ashamed of it. I mean, you were born with this body, and it's the only one you're going to get you could have a hell of a lot of fun with this body. If you take care of it, it's made for pleasure. We've got a lot of pleasure in us if we choose to, to use it that way. Let's get off of judging other people and judging other people's bodies. That's just as inappropriate. And guilt. Let's get away from guilt around our own desires and fantasies. Uh, generally speaking, I don't see much use for guilt. Maybe, you know, we could have a little discussion about maybe there's some places and times when guilt's appropriate. But around sexuality, most of the time, it's dysfunctional. It takes you away from enjoying who you are. So let's go on the offensive. And what I've seen, I think we've seen some progress here. And Marion Namazi set a great example a couple of years ago with the, uh, how many of you saw the calendar? Anybody buy the calendar or get the calendar? Well, two of my friends were in that calendar. You probably know, maybe one or both of these uh, people. Um, they decided they wanted to challenge patriarchal religion, just like Mariam did, Mariam did. 
Uh, by the way, this is in my own library, in my own house. And they didn't tell me they were doing it. I missed the whole photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I don't know how. And people don't believe me, but it really did happen. <laughs> so let's learn to ask some embarrassing questions. Does your preacher or priest or imam masturbate? Just a simple question. It's reasonable because they say not to masturbate, not right? The minute somebody says you cannot or should not do something, that opens a door for you to ask a simple question. Well, if you shouldn't do it, I want to know, do you do it? And then let them lie to you. What you want to do is either get them to tell the truth, oh yeah, I do masturbate, or get them to lie. Oh no, I would never do it. It doesn't matter which way it goes. You have created cognitive dissonance in their mind. And you've challenged fundamental assumptions about their religion. Did they have premarital sex? Uh, are you honest with your children about your own sex life, your own sexual history? If you had premarital sex, did you have 10 partners, 20 partners before you married your current husband or wife? Tell them. I mean, that's, there's nothing to be ashamed about on this. What we want to do is teach people to be responsible in their sexuality so they don't spread diseases or create emotional harm or hurt for other people. Uh, another question I like to ask religion is, do you expect your children to do what you couldn't do? I know so many Christians who had premarital sex who had multiple sex partners before they got married, and now they're telling their own children they can't do that. If the child said, but mommy or daddy, did you have sex before marriage? They'll lie to their children. I just want to challenge that. Make them think about it. Because Christians are so good at ignoring the obvious. And nobody's asking them. So be honest with your children. As a secularist, tell your children if you had several lovers before you were married. Tell them you started masturbating when you were 12 years old. Um, I found out at the American Atheist Commission when I gave this talk that a lot of people said that was wrong. They started when they were 11. <laughs> I had several come up to me afterwards. Uh, be, uh, be and act comfortable about your own sexuality. Challenge shame and guilt in yourself. If you feel shame or guilt, it's generally related to religious training or ideas. Your shame or guilt helps perpetuate guilt and shame and sexual oppression of other people. You don't know it. More game, you are giving off signals. You're giving signals to your children, to your sex partners, to your spouses, to any, everybody around you if you express, even in the most subtle ways, shame and guilt. And your inability to be open and honest about your sexuality is a sign of continued religious infection. I think we are unique. We are secular sexuals. We're not tied to, re to religious guilt like the Mormons or the Christians. Well, by the way, we found that Mormons were the most guilt-ridden religion in the United States of all the religions we saw. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Pentecostals were right behind them. But we're unique, and we don't have to act like Christians. So, sex is fun, and so is drinking. So let's do it responsibly. And there's no Jesus to forgive us if we hurt somebody else. Uh, don't be a vector. Don't be a vector for a God virus, and don't be a vector for a sexually transmitted infection. And, oh, by the way, going back to what Emily talked about, if you do have a sexually transmitted infection, don't be shameful or guilty about it. You got a cold. You didn't get guilt. You didn't feel guilty about the cold. You shook hands with somebody today. If you shook hands with them and got something from them, you're not going to feel guilty about that. Use a condom with your handshakes, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but what we know is if somebody has a sexually transmitted disease and feels shame about it, they're less likely to get treated. They're less likely to be honest with their sex partners. So they're more likely to transmit the disease in the first place. Shame helps transmit disease. In this case, sexually transmitted diseases. And that just helps religion, because then religion shames us more for the disease. The more people have sexually transmitted diseases, the more religion can shame us for having those diseases, the less treatment we'll get and the more we'll propagate them. I write about in the God Virus how religion and biological viruses work together. And they do. If you just look at the data of where disease and religion spreads, they're remarkably close together. And I'm not going to go into detail about it now. I don't have time for that. But get treatment. Own up to it. Talk out loud about it. Uh, because it causes us to be dishonest, withhold information from the partner, fail to get treatment, 
and it's largely based on religious indoctrination. So I wrote Sex and God to help us get over the infection that we still carry around in our own, in our own <coughs> mental processes. And uh, I want to help build a framework for us. I want to help build a framework for us to get rid of this infection that's still in our minds, the shame, the guilt. And I want to encourage us to be open and proud about our sexuality. And to that end, I have started this, I think, a new meme that I think is really cool. Uh, I've had, with some help from some other people, I want us to start talking about, I'm a secular sexual. I'm not a Catholic sexual. I'm not a Baptist sexual. I'm not a Mormon sexual. I'm a secular sexual. So if we can get rid of this guilt and shame as atheists and challenge the religionists about their guilt and shame, I think we can make some enormous progress. Because sex, as I said earlier, is the, is the bottom line for almost all the patriarch, for all the patriarchal religion. So I hope you will uh, consider these ideas, uh, consider them how you might use them in your daily life, in your own behavior. And I hope you'll go back and look at Sex and God, or the God Paris. I've got them for sale back there. And I've got some stickers. Uh, they're stick-on stickers. You can put them, I'll give them free to anybody who buys a shirt or a, or a book that you can stick on. I've got it right here on my computer. It says, I'm a sexual, I'm a secular sexual. And let's start talking in those terms. I'm not a Catholic sexual, I'm a secular sexual. And see what people say. You would not believe what that sticker does in the airport. When I'm sitting there working the looks I get. And every now and then a question. Wonderful opportunity to start talking about what human sexuality really is and not what Catholic, Baptist, or Mormon, or Muslim sexuality is. All right, thank you so much for your time, and uh, I'll take you up to the about uh, sexual trafficking, 
But if you look at the history, and, and, and there's some great, some, some good stuff out online about this. If you look at actually the number of convictions done around the porn industry on, on non-consensual or coercive stuff, yeah, there was some probably back in the 70s. You just don't see them hardly at all today. But you do see sex trafficking in other places in around prostitution. And you know, in states that don't regulate prostitution, you're actually opening up the possibility of exploitation. There's very little evidence. And, you know, I don't think it's a lack of looking. I think very little evidence that the porn stars that we see today are being exploited. Very little evidence for that. Now, if I'm wrong and you've got alternative ways, let, let me know. I'm, I'm open to reconsidering that. But the real problem with sex trafficking is not in the porn industry. Hit us in what's going on in New York City and Philadelphia and downtown Kansas City, women being forced because you know they're illegal immigrants or something like that into into sexual uh, actions that they don't want to engage in. Other other questions, comments? Yeah. Um, how do you think uh, the laws regarding prostitution relate to the women? Oh, I think they're intimately entwined. I think it's kind of interesting that uh, in wide areas of Australia, pornography is pretty much a non-deal. I mean, they they regulate it there, and it's legal. And there's not that much religion, although it's trying to come back in. I mean, you look at uh, the Netherlands, where the religions pretty much died, and they, they regulate they re regulate pornography. They regulate I mean, they don't regulate they regulate prostitution. You know, it's it's safer, less likely to be exploited if it's regulated. So. The religionists have tried to control sexuality because that creates guilt and brings it back to church. I mean, if you just read something like um, East of Eden, East of Eden by John Steinbeck, you will really see how that manifests itself in creating guilt and pushing people into behavior that they, you know, they wouldn't probably do. They wouldn't do it if they were secular, because the guilt drives them to doing crazy things with their own body and with other people's bodies. I don't know if that answers the question, but I think they're very close to five. And it goes back to the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, especially in the Midwest. I mean, right here in Wichita, <laughs> we were the Wild West in the 1870s. And some of those laws literally were on the books. 